I was heading to the gym one day and along the way I saw this random kiddie pool. It was set up outside one of the new Taipei Tech University buildings. I am compelled to check every body of water I pass by for fish, and this was no exception. So I peeked inside and I saw a fish, a super cute robot fish happily swimming across the pool. I emailed the research team for an interview twice and never heard back. If you can get in touch with them for me, I would love to talk to them. There are plenty of fish in the sea, and hopefully learning and mimicking them can give us better performing unmanned underwater vehicles. Today's video is about the robots that swim like fish. Today's unmanned underwater robots are mostly equipped with propellers. These rotary propellers are loud and not very efficient. If we are to measure this inefficiency using the ratio of useful power, which is thrust multiplied by forward velocity divided by the power used, then a propeller ranges from 40 to 70 percent. A fishtail, on the other hand, can clear over 86 percent, especially when optimizing their swimming methodologies. That might mean smaller batteries or no tethered power. And if these underwater vehicles have to navigate tight spaces, then they need to have these thruster propellers all over their supple metal bodies, with all the obvious drawbacks of such a thing. But there are types of fish out there capable of navigating really small spaces, stably moving backwards or front without fins all over their bodies. Why can't we have that? Over half a billion years, various fishes have evolved their own unique swimming styles. The first formal study of these swimming styles was in 1926. C. M. Bretter, an associate researcher at the New York Aquarium, published an article called The Locomotion of Fishes. He proposed two general style categories, body and caudal fin locomotion, or BCF. The caudal fin is the proper name for the fish's tail fin. The fish bends its body and rear tail back and forth, creating a backwards propulsive wave of water. Most people will recognize this type of swimming. Tuna, sharks, and so on are BCF swimmers. It is more suitable for long-term and high-speed swimming. The other major type is the median and paired fin locomotion, or MPF. These fishes use fins near their head or belly to move around. One example is the puffer fish, which swims around using a pair of pectoral fins located behind its gills. These swimming styles are more suited for maneuverability. Bretter's categorizations have largely held up over the years, though we have many subcategories now within each grouping. A decade later, a British zoologist named James Gray studied the swimming dynamics of a dolphin. I know, I know, dolphins aren't fish. But did you know that the Chinese word for dolphin is hai twin, which literally means sea pig? That makes me laugh. Anyway, what Gray found confused him. After estimating the sea pig's muscle power, he calculated that the animal needed seven times the strength it seemed to have in order to travel as fast as it did in the water, about 20 miles an hour in the water. His findings caused a stir upon the publication in 1936, and eventually came to be called as Gray's Paradox. Today, the general scientific consensus is that Gray made a few mistaken assumptions in his calculations, particularly related to the sea pig's musculature, the drag forces on its body, and its use of drafting to reach high speeds. But nevertheless, Gray's paradox triggered a torrent of research into the swimming styles of aquatic animals. Unfortunately, many of these studies failed to replicate the efficiencies of the real deal. A variety of theories were developed throughout the 1960s and 1970s to improve our understanding of animals in water. In 1960, the British mathematician Michael J. Lighthill published the first equation describing the movement of a fish. It breaks down the fish's movement into two actions. First, the body's undulation. Second, the tail fin's pitching motion. Using the equation, we can calculate out the movement and positioning of these two parts. This theory only described smaller movements involving a slight bending of the fish's body, small amplitude movements. So Lighthill revisited his theories over the decades. In 1971, he presented the, quote, large amplitude elongated body theory, end quote, which focused on larger, more heavily bent body movements in the water. Then he combined the two theories to create a generalized elongated body theory. 
This theory is called a reactive theory because it relies on Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal reaction. When a swimmer swims, their body is accelerating into the water. The water then reacts equally, creating a reaction force that moves the swimmer in some way. Elongated body is probably the most well-known and widely used theoretical description of swimming, but it is still a simplification with critical assumptions. New theories in the following decades, like J.Y. Cheng's wave plate theory, have attempted to shed new light on the motions and movements of the swimming fish. In the late 1980s, brothers George and Michael Triantafalu, God, I hope I pronounced that right, attempted to build a robot that swam as efficiently as a fish. They focused on the water vortices left behind by a fish's tail fin, an intimately intertwined story of flaps. A fish wants to accelerate. How do they do it? They start by making a hard first flap with their tail fin. This creates a large vortex in the water. A second flap then creates a different water vortex in the opposite direction while the first vortex is still spinning. The two vortices meet and combine to create a strong forward thrust, and whoosh, there the fish goes. The ability to create and use these large vortices was seen as key to a fish's efficiency. Trouts and salmons going upstream a river are known to exploit the whirling vortices created by rocks in the river, flapping in such a way to create counter vortices to help them save energy. With this knowledge, the brothers were able to create Robotuna. Robotuna's body is made up of pulleys, links, and aluminium hinges. Its skin is made from lycra fabric, spandex, essentially. Pressure sensors on Robotuna's skin help it measure the flow of water running over its body. Robotuna's speed and energy efficiency were promising, but unfortunately the robot is nowhere near as good as the real thing. In single short bursts, real tunas can accelerate up to 40 miles an hour. The reasons for this performance gap remain unclear. Debuted in 1995, Robotuna is universally acknowledged as the first fish robot. I would like to qualify that by mentioning that I did read about a mechanical carp built in 1976 by a Japanese team, but I haven't been able to locate any further info on that. Anyway, after Robotuna, the MIT-associated Draper Lab in 1998 produced an evolved version of the original Robotuna, the less amusingly named VCUUV, which stands for Vorticity Control Unmanned Underwater Vehicle. VCUUV incorporates improvements from the first Robotuna. It is a self-contained system capable of swimming and turning autonomously. In field trials, the robot can swim up to 2.8 miles an hour. In 2000, the MIT team followed up Robotuna and VCUUV with the Robopike, an experiment in replicating a fish's maneuverability without needing thrusters all over the machine. About 32 inches long and weighing just 8 pounds, the robot is modeled on a sleek-looking freshwater fish, somewhat confusingly called the chain pickerel. Robopike can swim reasonably well, but its sleek, sensual, highly optimized body makes it hard to add sensors and batteries. There were also initial issues with keeping the electronics dry, an underrated challenge. Since then, we've seen a proliferation of robotic fishes, taking inspiration from various members of the fishy families. We have the BCF fish robots, which you can break down into a variety of subclasses. I'm going to quickly run through a few of them. First, the anguilliform fish robots, which swim like sea snakes their bodies sort of sachet, generating thrust. EnviroRobot is a robo-eel developed by the Swiss Public Research University, EPFL. It is about 4 feet long and travels using 6 active modules and a flexible tail. EnviroRobot is meant to quietly monitor animals and nature, since its swimming style is discreet. Second, the sub and Corangiform robotic fish. These robots don't swim with full body swaying, their body movement happens in the final thirds of the body. The Eye Splash 2, yes that is its real name, and I bet a consultant got paid a whole lot to come up with it. This little robotic fish was developed by a team at the University of Essex, and is the fastest tail beating fish robot in the world, 
about 8.3 miles an hour. Does not sound like much, but to compare, the Olympic medalist Michael Phelps can go about 6 miles an hour. The downside of this little fishy is that it cannot turn. I feel like they should probably put that into the fine print. Thunderform swimmers keep their whole body stable, swimming only with their large, narrow, and crescent-shaped caudal tail. These are tunas and sharks, so Robotuna and its descendants go in here. The final big BC of category is Ostroform. Same as the tunaforms, these fish keep their body rigid and move their tail fins. The difference is in how they move those tail fins. Thuniform swimmers oscillate their tail fins to get efficient forward motion swimming. Ostroform swimmers, on the other hand, constantly flap their tail fins. To be frank, this is one of the least efficient BCF swimming styles, but the style is very stable, and the machines using these styles need few moving parts, so it is easier to seal them from water damage, keeping their essentials dry. One example is the Dory Bot, built by a team in the Polytechnic University of Marsh, Italy. If you recall from earlier in this video, MPF swimmers are those that swim using fins near the center of their bodies. Think rays, and that is indeed where we will start. Rajaform swimmers have two big fins on their sides, and they flap. One of these robots comes out of Italy, and is inspired by the cow nose ray. The robot is designed to slowly swim around the seabed for a long time. The fins are made from flexible silicone, and are operated with a motor. The tail serves as a rudder. They put it in a lake and found that it can cover about 0.4 meters per second, or less than a mile an hour. But that is what you can expect with this type of swimming, more stability and turning power, but less speed. Amiform and gymnotiform swimmers keep their body rigid and swim by waving a long fin that goes along their tops or bottoms, kind of like a knife fish or an electric eel. This gives them really good maneuverability in 3D space, going backwards or forwards without needing to change direction. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of robots here trying to mimic these fish. There's one conceptual prototype built by a team in Changsha, China, but that is about it. Labraform fishes are those like coral wrasses. They use their pectoral fins to maneuver around through rowing or flapping motions, but when they need a burst of speed, they use their tail fins. These fish robots are difficult to build. The fish have low endurance when using their pectoral fins, implying low efficiency. Furthermore, achieving stability has been exceptionally challenging. In my video about humanoid robots, I talked about the benefits of soft bodies. Many of these advantages apply here underwater too. Soft actuators can be quieter, more gentle, and more resilient than their hard counterparts. Probably the most commonly used soft actuator material for robotic fish swimming is the shape memory alloy. These are metals that can remember their shape for some time. Using heat, you can cause it to move. The water environment is ideal here because it helps cool down the SMA metal, increasing the frequency of motion. Robot fish have been developed with SMA wires, springs, and more. Other soft materials do the same thing using electricity. One notable recent Chinese robot is based on the snailfish. What this robot does will crush you. They took the robot's control unit, battery, and voltage amplifier and embedded it in a polymer. For movement, the robot uses dielectric elastomeres, soft stretching materials that kind of act like artificial muscles when an electric field is applied to them. The team brought this untethered self-powered robot to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and had it flap for 45 minutes under crushing pressures. One of the major issues with these fish robotics has to do with computation power. The real ocean world is full of environmental noise that can crowd sensors and confuse motion planning algorithms, not to mention complex underwater currents, dynamic obstacles, and predators. These fish robots' bodies have limited power and space available, yet its brain has to observe the outside world, respond to imminent threats, and work to achieve its longer-term goals. This remains an ongoing problem, one that scientists are taking inspiration from the real thing for. And actually, I think that was what the professor at Taipei Tech is actually working on, pathfinding rather than actual fish swimming mechanics. 
One of the first big questions I wanted to answer when I started this video was why. Why would anyone want a fish robot? This is nothing more than an over-engineered toy. But when you dig into it, you will quickly discover a number of significant real-world applications for these machines. Right off the bat, we have maritime monitoring. A cheap, quiet, and low-power fish swimming robot can be deployed for multiple underwater observation purposes as varied as mariculture management. One trial run set up a school of four swimming fish robots attached to a floating buoy that acts like a server, beaming information back to the home base. Maneuverable fish robots can be deployed for industrial inspection and maintenance. Such devices would have immense value for the offshore energy and cable communication industries. And on the military side, fish robots would be valuable in surveillance and minesweeping. There is a reason why DARPA funded MIT's RoboPike project. I know these robots aren't exactly what pops into your head when you think about underwater robots, but this is the ideal robotic swimming body. You may not like it, but this is what peak robotic swimming performance looks like. Nature has been working on their designs for half a billion years. It might make some sense to adopt some of that work. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.